Thank you very much. Uh, it's very fun to be here and see all the amazing progress you're making in so many different uh, directions. Now, um, it, it's true that I study babies, but actually the reason I study them is I'm interested, first and foremost, in questions about human cognition more generally. Uh, in particular, questions like, how is it that our abilities to gain new knowledge let us learn so rapidly and yet so flexibly, flexibly enough that we could become competent members of any human society, uh, present or past. Uh, another question, where do our abstract ideas come from? Uh, our most important concepts seem to center on things that you can't see or uh, feel uh, or act upon, uh, yet they're fundamental to everything from mathematics to morality. How do we get to have these abstract ideas? And finally, when we look at the perceptual abilities or action capacities uh, of humans, we look actually quite similar to those of uh, other animals. Yet when we look at our cognitive abilities, there seems to be this enormous gap. We seem to be qualitatively different in the ways uh, that we make sense of the world and learn about it. Uh, are those differences real? And if so, what do they come down to? Uh, what accounts for them? And I try to make progress on uh, uh, understanding at least a little bit uh, about uh, these three kinds of phenomena uh, by, by conducting behavioral, simple, low-tech behavioral studies on infants, uh, and then considering their findings in the context of four different comparative enterprises. One of them is compar comparisons across age, asking what's constant over development in our human cognitive capacities and what changes. Another is comparisons across people living in different cultures, growing up under different circumstances, with and without education, uh, with different kinds of access to information about the world, asking what's universal across different uh, uh, humans and what's variable from one place uh, to the next. The third is comparisons of uh, human cognition with cognition in other species, asking, as I said, what's you, what are the unique features of human cognition and what aspects of our cognitive abilities are shared uh, with other animals and where they are, how deeply are they shared, how ancient are those uh, capacities. And finally, comparisons across different levels of analysis, which, like I'm sure many of you, I think is really our best hope of getting some leverage, uh, not only on what we know and how much we learn, but how, how we know and how we learn. So in a normal talk, what I would do is take one of the things I work on, like, say, developing knowledge of natural number, uh, and try to attack it from all of these different perspectives, uh, relying primarily on research conducted over the last uh, couple of years and sharing with you my latest hypothesis about uh, how natural number concepts come about. But what I want to do today is something actually quite different uh, and novel for me. I want to focus just on behavioral work on human infants and raise three questions about what infants know. So this is going to be primarily a descriptive talk. I won't be asking how they know for the most part, but just what they know. First of all, what they know about objects. Second, what they know about agents, all kinds of agents, but I guess especially the ones they really care about, other people. Uh, and third, how they come to see the world as divided into entities of particular kinds, the kinds of things that we talk about, um, uh, ca uh, classify in images and uh, use uh, to reason about the world, uh, predict what we're going to be able to do with things and what will happen uh, to them next. Um, so the talk will be divided into these uh, three parts. And uh, in doing it, I'm not going to be focusing so much on very recent work, but kind of spanning a long range from some of the earliest things that I worked on to things that we're still in the process of studying today. So let me start with objects. Uh, it won't come as news to anyone in this room that our abilities to take a scene like this one that John Singer Sargent painted and immediately see it as an array of objects, mostly objects that even at this date, what, like 150 years uh, after it was painted, we're able more or less to recognize uh, that these abilities are really interesting. Uh, uh, object perception and representation is immediate and effortless for us for the most part, uh, yet very tricky uh, to get it 
right. So in this particular painting, nothing is floating in midair, which means everything is sit standing on or adjacent to something else, yet we seem to have no trouble perceiving its boundaries. Uh, nothing is fully transparent, so everything is partly out of view, uh, but we tend to apprehend an array of things that seem to have complete shapes and uh, take up full volumes of uh, space. We're also able to look at a scene like this and predict pretty well what would stay the same and what would change if we were to close our eyes for some period of time, altering our predictions for different um, uh, time scales. And finally, we're pretty good at predicting what would happen if we or someone else uh, were to make some change in this scene. If that woman were to stand up and bump into the table or pull on the uh, tablecloth, what would and wouldn't move, uh, what would and wouldn't uh, change. So that's for us as adults. My first question is going to be, what do scenes like this look like to infants? Do, in what ways are young infants able to uh, make sense of these kinds of arrays? And when I say young infants, I'm going to start out by talking primarily about studies of infants who are about four months of age. I love this age because on the one hand, four-month-old infants can do almost nothing. They can't sit up by themselves, they can't reach out and pick up objects, they can't manipulate things well, they certainly can't communicate with other people about objects, either using language or using pointing and following people's gaze, all that comes in later. But there's one thing they're really, really good at, uh, between birth and four months, their visual acuity improves enormously. Uh, so they're good at looking around at the world and learning uh, from what they see. And that enable, has enabled for the last uh, 40 years or more for people to do some very simple uh, and I hope revealing experiments. Let me start with some examples looking at this phenomenon of perceptual completion. So here's an experiment that was conducted by Philip Kelman, my very first graduate student ever, uh, low these many years ago. Uh, he presented babies with an object whose top and bottom was visible and whose center was occluded behind a block. It was presented in continuous mode Motion, back and forth, um, and he allowed babies to look at it for as long as they wanted, relying on a very pervasive phenomenon that babies show that we show as well. If you uh, present the same thing repeatedly, it becomes relatively less interesting over time, uh, showing that we form some memory representation for this. And if we then present something new, uh, our attention and also a baby's attention will typically increase, especially if they didn't expect to see the new thing that was being presented. So we can use this method to get at, um, to ask questions about what infants are seeing in this original um, partly occluded display. And what we found in this case was that after repeated presentation of a rod moving behind a block, looking time to the rod went down. That's the uh, curve you see there on this very long ago hand printed graph. Uh, sorry there are no er error bars, they didn't put them on back then. Uh, and then when the block was taken away, a big increase in looking to the broken rod providing evidence that the babies found that less like what they were seeing before, perhaps less expected uh, than the complete rod, uh, suggesting that they saw the uh, original center occluded rod as connecting behind the occluder. So we went on to vary the displays, used the same method with infants with other displays, asking at one point uh, what would happen if we presented the same display but with no motion at all. Uh, I thought that just as babies perceived what we saw in the first case, they would in the second but I was wrong. Uh, when there was no motion of the rod, after getting bored with the rod and block display, babies showed a distinct increase in looking equal in size to both of the test displays. This didn't reflect an inability to discriminate between the two test displays. Uh, that was just, I just described the top figure. The bottom two figures show that if instead of presenting a complete or broken rod behind the block, we had presented the complete or broken rod in front of the block, now babies would have continued boredom to the one that they had seen before and show a marked increase in looking uh, to the rod that they hadn't seen. But when it was behind the block, their perception seemed to be indeterminate and they seemed to show some interest in both of the um, unoccluded test displays, showing that the performance in the original experiment depended in some way on motion. Well, in what way? 
The simplest possibility is just maybe babies are very limited in what they can attend to. If everything is stationary, maybe they only attend to the nearest object in a scene, and motion pulls their attention back to further away objects. We tested that possibility by again presenting a center occluded rod, but now testing kids with a broken rod display with a gap that was larger than the occluder would have been able to cover. So if they simply weren't attending to anything other than the block, this display and the complete rod should look equally novel. But in fact, in this case, the upper figure here, babies uh, look distinctly longer at the, raw, at the broken display with the gap that could not have been hidden behind the occluder. This wasn't an intrinsic preference for that display because a separate group of infants shown that broken display behind the rod showed the reverse preference. So it looks like motion is doing something more for infants than just calling attention to um, the occlusion uh, display. Another possibility, of course, is that it, it calls, motion calls attention to the information in that display. Maybe babies are predisposed to connect onto a single object, uh, surfaces whose edges are aligned with each other. If that were right, then the same pattern of motion presented with non-aligned certain surfaces would not have the same effects. But in fact, we found it has the same effects. It looks like as long as the top and bottom are moving together, infants see them as connected behind the occluder, whether they're uh, aligned or not. So at this point we began to wonder, maybe it's, it's something more general than motion that babies are using to organize their visual world. Maybe any pattern of, of synchronous change would do the trick. So suppose instead of having a rod moving back and forth, we have a rod standing in one place but changing its color. We actually made this very, uh, uh, for the 80s anyway, disco-like uh, uh, display with, with internal lights inside the rod so it's alternately flashing in different colors. Babies loved it. They looked at it at least as much as they looked at the moving rod display. But when we subsequently tested them, they, they uh, were uncommitted as to whether the display changing synchronously in color was connected or not not behind the occluder. So it really looks like there's something special about motion. So the last study I'll share with you along these lines, or last set of studies, asked what kinds of motion work for infants. And we tried a variety, we've done a number of different studies. Here are just a few of them. Uh, we presented vertical motion, orienting the rod vertically instead of tilted so that the top grows while the bottom shrinks and vice versa. We presented motion in depth, uh, again, growing and shrinking on both sides. If you imagine these um, uh, segmentation, these uh, perceptual processes happening at the uh, level of pixels or of the retinal image, that's what they're doing. In fact, these are three-dimensional displays and the object is actually moving in depth. And we also tried two displays in which we moved the baby. Uh, we put the babies who were in all these studies seated in a little 80s-style uh, infant seat. We put them on a little trolley track, so they moved in an arc while looking at a rod uh, and block occlusion display and ran two different conditions. In one condition, the rod was actually stationary. Actually, everything was stationary except the baby. And so as the baby moved around, the image projected from that rod was displaced laterally in the infant's visual field, though never enough to bring the center into view. The other condition had the same motion by the baby, but now the rod also moved, and its movement was yoked to the movement of the baby so that it remained fixed in the center of the infant's visual field. Well, across these studies, what we found was success in every condition except the condition in which the rod was objectively stationary. Suggesting, I think, uh, that infant's perception of the connectedness of the visible ends of that occluder is happening through a process that's occurring relatively late in visual analysis. First, the infants are recovering information about the spatial arrangements and motions of surfaces, and then they're using patterns of common translation through three-dimensional space or maybe two-and-a-half-dimensional space uh, as information for what's connected to what within uh, this display. The fact that the evidence that this is happening late in visual analysis encouraged us to go beyond vision. I don't have a slide on this, but we did studies where we took babies and put rings in their hands um, so they could grasp the rings but not see anything, and they were able to move them around. And we could ask what factors influenced whether they would perceive those rings as connected to each other in the places where they couldn't feel them by subsequently turning the lights on and showing them connected versus separate wing displays. And short story is, basically, we we see the same patterns of 
success and failure in experiments only in the haptic modality as we had seen in uh, the visual modality. So that's all I want to say about perceptual completion. Let me talk much more briefly um, about perception of object boundaries. Uh, we've done study, and other people have done studies, asking whether when two objects are adjacent to each other, if one moves relative to the other, even though they remain adjacent, do babies see them as separate units? We've uh, tested infants' perception of object boundaries through two kinds of methods. One is to wait until about five months when infants start reaching for things and look at their patterns of reaching. Infants will tend to reach for only one object at a time, so you can flip the pattern, uh, the places at which they'll reach for an object depending on whether they see an array as one object or two. But the other method that works at least as well stays with looking time. We can present babies with an arrangement of two objects or one uh, and have a hand come to rest on the top of the display, lift the top up in the air, and vary what comes with it and see how long babies look. The idea being that if they saw this all as one connected object, they should look longer if the hand reaches and pulls only the top half of the display, leaving the bottom half of the display behind. Now, both of these methods um, supported the same general findings. I'll just give you the qualitative findings. When infants are presented with two adjacent objects that move together, they see them as one unit. When adjacent objects move separately, they see them as two units. When objects are separated in space by a gap that the infants can see, so here's a case where we see a difference between separation and depth, where there's no visible gap, and vertical separation, which I've um, depicted here. When they're separated in space, it doesn't matter how they're moving. Babies treat them as two objects and expect them in the future to move independently. And when they're stationary and adjacent, findings are mixed. But in many studies, infants don't clearly perceive the boundary between them under conditions in which adults do. That includes studies where we present just two blocks that are similar in size, but otherwise different in shape, color, texture, and so forth. And even true in experiments by Fei Xu and Susan Carey, uh, when infants are presented with objects that they might well be familiar with, like the rubber duckies that uh, have been populating infants' baths for uh, decades. So those are often seen as one object, though not always. Um, the general conclusion is that infants perceive object boundaries primarily by analyzing patterns of motion and uh, spatial arrangements among surfaces, uh, as they do in the case of um, partly occluded objects. Well, let me move to cases where objects move fully out of view. When an object moves through a scene such that it travels behind other objects and there's periods of times when it's not visible at all, what do infants see? Do they see three separate encounters, in this case, uh, with that object that passed behind two screens? Do they see a single persisting object that moved continuously through space? Uh, do they see something else? Uh, we and others have um, uh, tried to address this question in a number of ways. Here's one um, experiment. Uh, we presented one group of infants with the continuous pattern of motion I just showed you, except that the thing moved back and forth uh, continuously throughout the time that they were looking at it. A second group of infants saw the same motion on the two sides of the uh, two occluders, but they never saw an object move between them. To adults, it looks like there's two different objects there in that scene, which in these first studies, which were done, uh, they, so these studies, many of these studies have subsequently been done with um, video displays, but the first studies were with real objects. That, in fact, was what uh, we had to present in that condition. And then, at test, the occluders were taken away, and infants saw one object move a short distance on one side of the screen, either alone on the stage or with a second stationary object next to it. Uh, we ran a baseline condition where babies got that same test display after unrelated uh, uh, familiarization displays not involving objects and not involving uh, occlusion, screensaver-like uh, displays, to see what their intrinsic preferences were between these two test displays. We found that babies, not surprisingly, tended to be more interested in the array with two objects than the array with one. But relative to that baseline preference, we saw two reliable effects of the prior familiarization with the object moving in and out of view. If it moved continuously, babies had a stronger preference at test for two objects, suggesting they had seen that display as a single object. When it moved discontinuously, the preference uh, pulled them in the opposite direction. Despite the fact that they were actually getting less exposure to the object in the discontinuous display, they inferred uh, a larger number of objects in the scene, two objects in that uh, case. So it looks like in this uh, 
uh, situation, four-month-old infants are seeing objects as persisting and moving continuously when they uh, move in and out of view. Well, the most famous studies of tracking objects over occlusion were done by Renee Bayergeon. She developed this ingenious method where she presented babies. You're seeing a side view of it. I should make an animation of a front view. Sorry about that. But I'll pantomime it for you. Uh, babies see a screen which is lying flat on the stage, which rotates up about its far edge away from the infant, uh, and then comes to rest flat on the stage again after rotating 180 degrees around that edge. Then it reverses direction and comes back down, and they see that rotation continuously. After they've gotten familiar with that, she takes an object and places it behind the screen when it's flat on the table, uh, so the object's clearly in view, in the path of the screen's motion, and starts the rotation again. And now one of two things happens. Either the screen rotates fully as it did before, and as I suppose it would if the object weren't there, uh, or it comes to rest when it reaches the point where the object, uh, which is no longer visible, uh, would be encountered and then reverses direction. And she compares infants looking to those rotation events to the same rotation events except that there's no object in the path of the screen during test. And she's run this a bunch of different ways with an object off to the side or further away behind the screen or no object at all. Uh, in all of those control conditions, there's no clear difference in infant's attention to the different screen rotations. But in the case where there's an object in the path, infants look reliably longer when the screen undergoes the full rotation through the space that that object should be uh, occupying, suggesting that they expected the screen to stop when it got to the fully occluded uh, object. Finally, uh, final study of um, infants' representation of objects over uh, occlusion asked what infants expect to happen when two objects collide. The previous study suggests they uh, represent objects in accord with the notion that two things can't be in the same place at once, but what happens when two things contact each other? Uh, should they change their motion? Uh, and a number of studies have uh, gotten at this, presenting events uh, that I've uh, kind of given a cartoon uh, demos up here from the uh, reading from the top down, where first there's an object that's stationary, partly hidden behind a screen. Another object moves onto the stage, heading toward the first object and disappears behind the screen. And then the first object, the, the one that was partly visible, the blue object here, starts to move and comes fully into view. Uh, and babies are familiarized with that, they see it repeatedly, and then the screens are taken away, and they see in alternation events in which the first object contacts the second at the point at which it starts to move, and events in which it stops short of the second, there's a pause, and then it starts to move at the appropriate uh, time. And under these circumstances, infants seem to expect that the objects, or infer that the objects started to move on contact with the thing that was heading toward it. They look longer at the event with a temporal and uh, spatial gap. And further studies show they also make the reverse inference. If one thing, if the red thing is moving behind the screen and the blue thing doesn't move, they infer that it doesn't contact it, uh, that it stops uh, short of it. Okay, last study on occlusion. Do infants have expectations about the properties of objects that move in and out of view? If an apple moves behind a screen and a toy duck comes out, will they uh, use that property difference to infer that there's two objects taking place in this event, and at the point when neither of them was visible, there are two objects behind the screen? So uh, Fei Xu and Susan Carey uh, addressed this question by familiarizing infants to the occlusion event on the left and then showing, then removing the screen and showing in alternation displays with two objects and displays with one. Uh, I think both of them and most of the world expected that babies who had passed all those other tests would pass this one, but they didn't. Uh, they seem quite uncommitted as to the number of objects taking part in these events. And that's true despite the fact that there was other evidence internal to this study that babies detected the feature changes. Uh, they compared uh, infants' looking time during the events in which they alternately saw an apple and a duck to their looking time during events where they saw an apple on both sides of the screen or a duck on both sides of the screen. And infants looked much longer to the events uh, showing the feature changes. But those changes didn't support for them the inference that there's two distinct objects there uh, behind the screen. Uh, what's more, uh, study, a study by the same group that I already told you about 
shows that probably this problem isn't specific to occlusion because when infants see two objects clearly of different kinds that are well known to them, they still, when those objects are put adjacent, seem uncommitted as to whether they're now one connected body uh, or two. Uh, and this is true up till 10 months of age. By 10 months of age, a child who is shown a truck with a duck on top is very likely to go vroom vroom or show other signs that they recognize that that truck is, a, is you know, they, that, what, that they've seen those features before and they know what you're supposed to do with it. Uh, yet they're uncommitted as to whether uh, the truck should, if you pick up the duck by its neck, whether the truck should move with it. Okay, so to summarize all this, it looks like by um, three to five months of age, infants are analyzing patterns of object motion to represent objects as cohesive bodies. They're extrapolating object motion on connected and unobstructed paths, that's the solidity findings, and they're inferring that objects interact on contact. So how does this knowledge emerge and grow in infancy? I think we can get evidence from two kinds of sources. One are studies comparing responses of infants of different ages up until now, except at that very last study at 10 months, I've been talking really only about four-month-olds. And another is by uh, looking to studies of other animals. Let me give you a few quick examples of each of these. Here's some work by Renée Bayergeon. She looked at uh, babies developing knowledge of uh, the conditions under which objects are stably supported by very simple studies where she had a big block on the stage and a hand came in holding that smaller block uh, that's on top of it and either placed it on the top surface of the big block or one of the side surfaces of the big block, then removed her hand and it stayed there. Question, at what point would babies look longer when it stayed stably supported uh, on the uh, big block's side? Answer, they showed that effect at five months but not at three months. When she went on to vary the conditions, so the object's always on top, but uh, in one case it's stably supported on top, in the other case it really should fall, she again found a developmental change, though now that change happened later. Interestingly, we found a change around the same time in a different kind of event where we presented babies on video with displays in which we had an inclined uh, plane, we released a ball at the top and we allowed it to roll down with natural acceleration. And after babies were familiarized with that, we showed them two events involving a plane that was inclined in the opposite direction. In one of them, we placed a ball at the bottom and gave it a push and it moved upward decelerating. In the other, we had rotated the camera so we were able to place the ball at the bottom, release it stationary, and it rolled upward accelerating. Now, at five months of age, babies actually seemed to expect the last of those events. Be, uh, having seen a ball accelerating downward, they were less excited to see a ball accelerating upward than to see a ball decelerating upward. But by seven months, they showed the opposite pattern. Uh, so I think an expectation of downward acceleration in relation to gravity, at least in this context, is also developing over this age range. Now, nobody has studied directly the role of learning uh, in these experiments, but I think it's very likely that these changes depend on learning. And what's more, I think it's likely that the looking patterns that I've been using throughout this talk so far uh, to probe what infants are uh, understanding about the visual scenes around them are being driven by a functional property of uh, looking to anomalous events. That when something unpredicted happens, that's a good learning signal for an infant. They should pay attention and learn about that. Now, very recently, some studies were conducted by Lisa Feigenson and her collaborators with 11-month-old infants that looked directly at this assumption to see whether it was true. Now, what they did in these studies is repeat some of the studies that I've already described that have been conducted with much younger infants with one change. Instead of allowing infants to look at the outcome events in which an object seems to defy solidity by ending up on the far side of a wall or defy gravity by getting pushed off uh, another object and hanging in midair, uh, after those, uh, uh, they were only allowed to see those events for 10 seconds. Uh, so all of the kids looked the maximum amount of time at those two events. And then she tested how much they were able to learn about these objects under those different conditions. So in one study, what she did, as soon as the events were done, either an expected event in which an object stopped short of a barrier or an unexpected one where it appeared on the far side, or similarly for the um, uh, support events, she picked an object up, squeaked it, and demonstrated that it made a distinctive sound. 
And then she tested infants to see how well they learned that sound distinction by presenting that object uh, among a set of other objects and playing a whole bunch of different sounds and seeing if they would specifically look at that object when they heard the sound that had gone with it. And what she found was that infants showed better learning uh, about the sounds made by the objects that had violated solidity or support than about the sounds made by the other objects. She also did a test of exploration. This is a separate group of infants now who saw these same events, got to see them for 10 seconds, but then they were given the objects that had participated in these events to explore. Two interesting findings. First, the infants manipulated the object that violated solidity or support more than the object whose behavior accorded with it. This seemed to motivate them to explore that object. But they also explored those objects in different ways. For the one that had violated solidity, they tended to pick the object up and bang it on the table. For the one that had violated support, they tended to pick it up and release it. Okay? It looked like their exploration was appropriate to the events that they had failed uh, to predict. So I think these looking patterns are reflecting something like an active attempt to understand uh, 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 the uh, prediction errors, the sources of the prediction errors that they had made. Uh, but a question that still remains is whether all infants' object knowledge is learned. The obvious way to test this would be to go to newborn infants. The problem is that newborn infants have really immature uh, uh, visual perceptual abilities, especially immature abilities for perceiving continuous motion and tracking continuous motion across a display. So some studies have been done with newborns. We know that like four-month-olds, they do perceive the connection between the top and bottom of a center occluded object, for example, but most of them uh, have not. Fortunately, though, there are many other animals that succeed at perceiving objects under the same conditions that four-month-old infants do, uh, and whose visual capacities are much more mature at birth than our uh, human capacities are. And uh, my favorite species of late is the domestic chick. I seem to have a penchant for studies that can be done without a whole lot of money, and apparently controlled rearing experiments on chicks are a really good example of that. This is work that was done by Lucia Regalin and Giorgio Volertigara in Italy, um, they used an imprinting method. So if you take a chick and hatch them from an egg in an environment where there are no other chicks around, but you present a moving object, uh, they will uh, treat that object as if it's mom. If you put them in a stressful situation and that object is there, they will run over to be near her. Uh, and you can use this the way we would use looking time to ask uh, what they represent about that object. So for example, um, uh, a chick who has imprinted to fully visible mom, as in the photograph, will run over to mom with an occluder in her center in preference to mom with an a gap and an occluder behind her center, providing a piece of evidence, they have many more studies, that chicks, uh, new, uh, newly hatched chicks, like uh, newborn infants, are uh, sensitive to occlusion. But let's look at object permanence. So in these studies, chicks were familiarized for two days uh, in a cage with a single object that bobbed around in the cage. They could bring that object in and out of view by turning away from it or closing their eyes, but there were no other objects in the cage, so they never got to see it occluded by anything else. Uh, then they were put in the following experiments. Uh, these experiments were all modeled on classic studies by Piaget that were done on um, human infants. Uh, in this study, there's two screens, and mom uh, uh, is visible between the two of them, and the chick sees her move behind one of the screens, and then there's a delay. This is all happening while the chick is standing behind plexiglass so he can't get to mom. Uh, there's a delay after which the plexiglass door is opened and the chick is allowed to go, and indeed the chick would go to the screen where mom had disappeared. So having found that, uh, showing, uh, providing initial evidence that they're representing mom as existing over occlusion, they went on to ask whether you could do the Biogen solidity experiment on chicks and would you get the same result. So for this one, the chick is watching, there's the two screens, on some trials mom goes behind one, on some trials she goes behind the other, but they're never allowed to come out and find her. They can simply watch these events and she will eventually, after a delay, reappear. All of that was familiarization. Then comes the test. Uh, mom is visible between the two screens, and then all the lights in the room go out. And when the lights come on again, mom is no longer visible, and the screens are rotated back 
different distances. Where will the chick go look for mom? He will go to the side where the rotation is consistent with her presence as a solid object. So over a set of studies where they varied mom size and the degree of angle of rotation, they find evidence that the chick represented uh, mom's uh, position, inferred mom's position uh, from a notion that she and this screen can't be in the same place at the same time. I think what we have here is a goldmine of a method for testing both effects and non-effects of experience on uh, uh, development of visual object uh, representation and scene understanding, and I hope it's used much more in the future. But just to summarize, Human infants and other animals organize perceptual displays into objects. Uh, so do controlled weird chicks in the limited conditions where they've been tested. Infants also learn uh, things about objects. And most important, really, we don't know how they do any of these things. I've given you a list of things that infants can and can't do, but we don't know what mechanisms are at work uh, in uh, the chicks' minds, uh, what kinds of computations uh, they're making, uh, uh, how they're uh, accomplishing what they're accomplishing here. Uh, I do hope that uh, somebody will be inspired to do uh, combined work uh, with behavioral experiments and computational modeling to get at this. But let me turn to my second topic, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to speak faster because I want to get to three, uh, and talk about agents. Now, there's a lot of things I don't need to tell you about agents because in many ways agents are just like other objects, but there's at least one important way in which they're really different. Agents can generate their own motion. They can act cause themselves to move, and by acting, cause changes in the world of objects. Uh, which raises the question, do young infants understand this property of agents, and do they make differential predictions and inferences about agents in accord with this property? Now, uh, and a uh, fairly old study that tried to look at this used one of the methods from the object uh, uh, studies that I've already talked about, with seven-month-old infants replacing the objects with agents. So for this study, we actually moved to videotape and showed babies an event in which one person was standing motionless, partly visible behind a screen, and another person moved behind the screen. And then when the second person was fully hidden, the first person started to move. And the question is, did the two people come into contact or not? We also ran the study on video with large inanimate objects and found there that kids behave the same way as they do with tabletop size objects in the studies I showed you before. They infer contact between the objects behind the screen. In the case of people, they did not make this inference. They were equally happy with events in which the two people made contact with each other and events in which they did not, suggesting that at least by seven months of age, infants recognize that people can initiate their own motion. Um, they don't have to be set in motion by some other external cause. Other studies have shown, however, not surprisingly, that uh, contact does constrain the motions of people for infants when people are acting on objects. So if a person is going to move, set that block in motion behind the screen, they're going to have to come into contact. Infants will infer that they came into contact with it. So could this causal attribution be innate? To my knowledge, this hasn't been studied in younger human infants, but a very similar experiment was conducted again by the Valortagara group uh, in chicks using imprinting, and, not answer, and, and this time not asking the question, where's mom, uh, but which of these two creatures is mom? So in this study, instead of imprinting, exposing chicks to a single object during the imprinting period, they exposed chicks to an event involving two objects, a Mashadian launching event in which one object, uh, two objects start at rest, then the first one moves into contact with the second, and the second one starts to move as the first one stops. So uh, uh, the, inf the chicks saw this event uh, again and again during the imprinting period, and then they were tested. The two objects differed in color. One was red, the other was purple. They were tested in a novel, therefore stressful, room with each of the two objects at one side of the room. And the question is, which object will the chicks gravitate to? And in this circumstance, they gravitated to the object that had previously been on the left that had started moving on its own and collided with the other object. Now, they realized that this could have happened for many reasons, so they did a number of variations on this display. I'll only tell you about one of them. Uh, in this variation, all they did was add occluders 
to the two sides of the display so that throughout the imprinting period, the chicks were never able to see that left object go from a state of rest to a state of motion. It entered from behind the occluder already in motion. That completely abolished the preference for that object. So putting this together with the first finding, I think what this shows is that in the first case, the chicks represented uh, mom, the, the preferred mom, as the object that caused its own motion uh, by going from a, st a state of being station of rest to a state of motion. Of course, the other object also went from a state of rest to a state of motion, but it did so on contact with the first object, suggesting that the chicks also represented uh, mom, not only as causing her own motion, but as causing a change in the other object. So it looks like what we have here is it's, it's not evidence that these are innate for humans, uh, but it's an existence proof that you could Ha that, that there are living visual systems that do these computations the very first time they're encountering uh, these objects with no other objects that they've ever uh, been given experience with. Okay, so uh, if chicks at, at hatching and humans, at least by uh, seven months of age, expect that agents can move spontaneously. That means that agents' motions aren't fully predictable from a consideration of their context. Does that mean they're simply unpredictable, or do infants have other ways of predicting and making sense of the actions of agents? Well, here's another simple experiment that uh, addressed a piece of that question. This is work by Amanda Woodward. She presented uh, infants with a puppet stage that had two objects on it and a hand that reached out and grasped one of the two objects. And again, this follows the uh, looking time, uh, preference for novel, uh, getting bored with seeing the same thing repeatedly preferring something novel uh, method. Uh, after babies were bored looking at this hand reaching the ball for half the infants, the teddy bear for the others, the two objects switched position. And now infants saw in alternation events where the hand moved on the same trajectory to a different object and events where the hand now moved on a new trajectory to the same object that it had moved to before. And they found that infants looked longer when it moved on the old path to the new object, suggesting that they had represented the original action as directed to that goal object, not simply as a trajectory through space to a particular position in space. So extensions of this study asked what are the conditions under which you do and don't see this effect. You don't see it if you remove the hand and substitute a mop, uh, an inanimate object for the hand. You also don't see it if you keep the hand but have the hand passively fall on an object instead of uh, deliberately reaching for it. And perhaps most interesting, you don't see this effect in three-month-old infants who haven't yet started reaching for objects themselves though you do see it in five-month-olds uh, who, uh, who have. So infants may need to learn that reaching and grasping are object-directed actions, whereas passive falling of a hand is not. Until an infant has sorted that out, they may not be able to show this pattern of uh, goal-directedness. Now, once infants identify a goal-directed action, we can ask a further question. Do they expect that an agent will act to achieve that goal as efficiently as the circumstances allow? Now, the Hungarian psychologist Jori uh, Gerge has been studying uh, this question for 15 more, 20 years now, uh, using simple animated displays. Here's an example of some, they, they're, uh, some of his displays. On repeated trials, infants would see two round animated characters first interact with each other as if they're having a conversation at a distance, and then one of the characters would jump over a wall, which separated the two characters, to get to the other one. And over trials, the height of the wall would vary, and with it, the height that that character would jump, always jumping just high enough to clear the wall. The question was this, if we now take the wall away, what will the character do? Will he continue jumping, or will he now take a straight path to get to the object? And the finding from infant's looking time is that they expected him to take a straight path. Uh, uh, however, if one makes a simple change in the display, removes the wall from the situation from the get-go, now you don't see that pattern anymore. So it looks like what was going on in the original event is that they saw the wall as an obstacle to the character's motion, and they saw the character as efficiently as surmounting that obstacle, as efficiently as the uh, circumstances would 
uh, allow. Now, all these studies were only done with infants down to six or seven months of age. What happens with younger infants? Here there's actually a method that's been devised that uh, allows us to ask that question with three-month-old infants who aren't yet reaching for things uh, using an ingenious device of mittens with Velcro on them. So uh, in these studies, three-month-old infants are given mittens covered with Velcro and an object on a table that also has Velcro on it. So that when they, at three months, infants like to flail their arms around, when they uh, happen to contact this object, instead of it rolling out of their reaching space, which is what will typically happen in the frustrating world of a three-month-old infant, now their hand will stick to the object and they'll be able to entrain it and move it around at will. So they're allowed to do that for about two minutes and then they're given the Woodward test of goal directedness, watching another agent wearing the same mittens, reaching repeatedly for one of two objects that then switch positions. And what they found, um, comparing this group to a control group that got the same mittens, uh, the same test of goal directedness but with no prior mittens experience, now the, the couple of minutes of mittens experience was sufficient to get babies to show the older infant pattern of encoding the reach by the other person as directed to the goal object and expecting a new reach on a new trajectory to the same goal object. So it looks like the brief mittens experience affects their understanding of these actions. Given that it does, Amy Scary and Susan Carey and I were able to ask whether three-month-olds also expect actions to be efficient. The idea here was to give mittens experience that that um, ball is the agent's goal, and then to show human versions of the Gergay events where the agent reaches over a barrier to get to that ball, and then the barrier is removed, and the question is, will the agent move on the same curved path or on a new straight path? And what we find is that the babies who had the mittens experience infer that the agent will now move on a straight path. The others, of course, didn't see the action as goal-directed in the first place, so the question of efficiency doesn't arrive, arise. We went on to show that uh, infants only show this effect if initially there was a barrier um, in their path. This says that they're, they're expecting straight motion only when the previous actions were constrained by the barrier and therefore were efficient, even though babies themselves aren't able to reach over barriers to get to objects until they're like eight months of age, and even though in the sticky mittens case there were never any other objects in the scene to serve as barriers, they didn't have first-person experience of those barriers, but they seem already to expect efficiency. So it looks like babies aren't learning from the mittens experience that reaching is constrained by barriers or that agents will tend to reach um, uh, in the most efficient manner possible, what then might the, reaching, the mittens experience be doing? My best guess is that it allows for a reanalysis of an otherwise really mechanically complicated pickup event as a simple contact event. Instead of having to figure out how to grasp an object and how much pressure to exert on it, you merely have to contact the object and you're able to set it in motion. If that's right, then we ought to get babies to be able to succeed at three months in inferring, expecting efficient action with no mittens experience if we change the events from a reaching event to a simple contact event. So that's the last study we did along these lines. Uh, we present a person who reaches over a barrier and simply touches a ball, which then lights up and makes a noise, so it's a pure contact event, and ask, when the barrier is removed, do they now expect a novel path uh, straight reach, comparing uh, their uh, looking to uh, the different uh, reaching events without the barrier to that of a comparison condition where the barrier is never in the agent's uh, path to begin with, and we find uh, positive evidence for uh, an efficiency assumption in the infants at three months of uh, age without any mittens experience. I think one possible interpretation of these findings is that infants expect agents to minimize the costs of their actions, that they're representing an abstract property of actions, namely the cost or effort involved um, in achieving them. But we're far from uh, having nailed that case. Let me end this section by just give, telling you about a few of our more recent findings. This is work with uh, Shari Liu. She's asked, uh, suppose you present the uh, Gerge events of an agent jumping over a barrier to get to an object, but then at test 
you don't take the barrier away, you just make the barrier very small. So there's no single direct path that will get to the object. The, the agent has to deviate. Do infants expect that the agent will deviate by the least degree needed to get over the barrier? So you compare uh, test events with a small jump over a barrier to a large jump, uh, and compare everybody in that condition with the second condition where the barrier is out of the way of the agent. And again, we get evidence um, now at six months of age that infants are computing something like the continuous cost of an action, expecting agents to minimize their cost uh, as far as possible. Something a little more complicated than just a simple rule, agents will move in straight lines or move on a shortest distance path to an object. Um, some kind of assessment of continuous cost. Here's the last study along these lines I want to tell you about, and um, uh, I think one look is worth uh, my too many words, so have a look. Can you hear the agent? So he goes to the object over one barrier, refuses to go over a second barrier, and then there's another agent. And he goes over one barrier and refuses to go over the second higher barrier. Hmm. Okay, wait. Uh, so across these events, the agent goes equally often to each of the two objects, goes to each once, refuses each once, but the cost that he's willing to take to get to one of them is higher than the cost he's willing to take to get to the other. To see whether infants would infer that he liked the second guy more than the first, we then test infants with events where all three are, uh, characters are present at the same time. The key agent is in the middle. He turns to look to each of the other two and then alternately goes uh, to each of them. Half of the infants saw these events where the higher valued character is the yellow guy, half saw events with the screen, the barriers reversed, so it was the other guy who was more valued. And across the whole study, infants seemed to expect that the guy, the, the central character would approach the one for whom he had previously taken a higher cost. And they look longer at the less expected event where he goes to the other guy. Now, uh, this is not a killer uh, experiment saying they really are uh, utilitarians. It could be that infants simply think, simply associate higher value with a longer path of motion or a higher speed of motion. We're starting to track those possibilities down. Hot off the presses is a finding that if you equate for path length and path speed, but vary the angle of inclination that the agent has to climb to get uh, to the goal. These are 10-month-old infants, so beyond the age of seven months where they know things will tend to move downward, not upward, we get the same effects as we get in the uh, jumping barrier case. So I think we're building a case that infants may be understanding agents um, as uh, acting to uh, maximize their rewards at, while uh, minimizing their cost. So to summarize, um, I've talked about candidate core concepts of objects as cohesive and continuous and uh, movable on contact, uh, which could be the rudiments of a naive physics. Uh, candidate core concepts of agents as actors uh, whose actions are directed to goal objects min at minimal effort uh, and directed to uh, goals of higher value, which could be part of the rudiments of a naive psychology. I think there's more to naive psychology that I don't have time to talk about today. And I uh, hope I'm leaving you with some key unanswered questions. Here are two that are high on my list of questions I'd like to answer. Uh, do infants understand object interactions in terms of concepts, abstract concepts of forces and masses? Or do they understand them in terms of concepts that are closer maybe to perception of bodies and uh, motions? Do they understand agents' plans in terms of concepts of costs and rewards, or rather in terms of, cons uh, again, somewhat less abstract concepts of uh, actions and goals? So I think if there's going to be time for questions, I may not be able to tell you about the third thing I wanted to tell you about, um, how infants come to see objects as instances of kinds. Maybe I'll just give you the bottom line uh, from those studies. I told you that there was a, a task that 10-month-old infants fail, 
the task of using information about the shapes and other properties of objects and about the kinds to which they belong in order to determine when they are uh, successively encountering the same object at two different places and times and when they're encountering two distinct objects at different uh, uh, places and times. A couple more um, findings from Shu and Carey. Um, this is an ability that emerges between 10 and 12 months of age, and it's linked to language in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, infants succeed when they're presented with two objects whose common names differ from each other. If the common names are the same, so a cup on the left and a cup on the right, then even if the objects are quite radically different in shape, infants uh, do not treat them as distinct objects in this task. Also, at 11 months, you can predict who's going to succeed at this task using the property information to determine there are two objects there from parents' reports of whether they know they've learned the names for the objects that, that adults would commonly use uh, to name them. Uh, this then motivated a bunch of experiments that uh, Fei Xu has conducted, and I'm not going to use my animation and take you through them, but just say that uh, across these experiments, she's shown that you can manipulate the number of objects that a nine-month-old infant will see in a scene by giving them either the same name or a different name. Give them different names and they see two objects, give them the same name and they see uh, they represent uh, a single object. This works with novel names as well and novel objects as well as with familiar ones. And in further studies they show that infants will not only use names to figure out how many objects are in a scene, but also to figure out if there are two objects in a scene, uh, sorry I'm going so fast on this, if there are two objects in a scene, um, uh, and you've used the same name, then those two objects probably have the same shape. Whereas if you've used a different name, they probably have different shapes. Moreover, if two objects have different functions, uh, they make different sounds when you act on them. Uh, uh, or, or the same function, uh, they make the same sound when you act on them. If you've used two names, they expect different functions. If you've used a single name, they expect the same function. So it looks like somewhere between 9 and 12 months of age, infants are starting uh, to master both the language and this conceptual apparatus we have for seeing everything that's out there in the world as an instance of a kind with a characteristic a uh, set of mechanical properties, a characteristic internal structure signaled by its shape, and a characteristic function for the infant, for other people, and if it's an animate object, for the object itself that that shape uh, permits. Um, now, I think other animals can link this information and form kind concepts in special cases, but what's really striking, I think, about human cognition is how productively we apply this notion to novel cases, and that we see already in the infants uh, when they're presented with novel objects named by novel names. We see this very rapid learning of uh, object kinds, really literally one trial learning of object kinds. I think this is a really smart kind of learning for infants to show, because if they're using language, the, the language they hear people around them speaking, uh, that language is going to be a good signal to what the kinds are that are most, most worth learning about, the things that adults find most useful to talk about. Uh, so what do babies know? I think they know something about physics uh, and uh, psychology. I didn't talk about this, but I also think they know something about uh, uh, places in the environment and their geometric properties, uh, visual forms, uh, and their small scale um, relations of relative length and angle, uh, numbers, and the social world. And they know how to learn a language uh, and to use it to enable rapid and smart learning in this domain and I think uh, in others. Now, does any, should any of this matter uh, to any of you? Well, I'm not a computer vision person and I don't really know. There is one computer scientist I like quite a lot who thought it might be a good idea to try to build smart machines by building machines that learn the way children uh, learn. And of course, I think that's a fabulous idea. Uh, although this may not always be true in every future that we can envisage, I think it's pretty clearly true right now that young uh, human infants and young children are the best learning machines we have on the planet. And figuring out how they do that and building some of those principles uh, into other learning machines might be a good way to get those machines to be smart as well. Now, uh, Turing had a different reason 
for thinking it would be a good idea to uh, uh, build smart machines by modeling a child brain. He, su he suggested maybe the child's brain is something like a notebook as you buy it from a stationery, rather little mechanism, and lots of blank sheets. And he goes on to say this would be a really good thing because it would make our, our problem of programming that machine that much easier. Now, I think research on infants suggests that indeed uh, there are a lot of blank sheets in there, but I don't think it suggests that the mechanism is simple. Instead, we seem to be seeing signs of at least seven different mechanisms in these young infants, and there may be more. Mechanisms for representing objects and agents and social beings and number two systems of geometry and a mechanism for uh, learning uh, a natural language. And there's two things that make this problem even worse. One is, we don't have the right computational account of any of these mechanisms. That's a task that still needs to be accomplished. And problem two, you guys are all working at an incredibly fast pace. Infant research has been glacially slow. Each baby had to be brought into the lab and studied, and then there were like 20 different interpretations for their findings that we needed uh, to sort through. But there's two things that make me optimistic that this project is uh, achievable. One of them is I think there's going to be a big change in how we collect data on uh, what infants know, uh, thanks to web-based testing, which is coming soon uh, to a child near you and will allow us uh, to uh, uh, ask to, to do many, many more studies to test babies much more quickly, and also to collect data on larger samples that will allow us to test subtly different predictions from different computational theories. Second, as I said, this is an unusual talk for me. I've been focusing entirely on babies. But while uh, we learn things about babies, we've also been learning a lot about cognitive development. And one of the things we've been learning is that the systems that we find in young infants aren't scaffolding that we kick away when we get older. They are still there in older children and adults. So we can study their properties by studying uh, adults as well, uh, both in our culture and in other culture. And uh, as I suggested with the chicks, we have animal models of many of these systems that we find in infant minds. And that opens up a whole panoply of methods that can be used for studying them. So all of this makes me very optimistic about a future partnership that uses joint uh, work in computation and in empirical psychology to try to answer two questions. One is, how can we build Maybe, the, maybe not the smartest machine, but a machine that would be extremely useful to humans because it construes the world the way that we do. And second, how can we get a better understanding of human minds and how our minds work? I think that project is at least as important, and it's going to be central to any efforts we might want to make now to anticipate how we're going to adapt to the world that our and your uh, technologies are creating. Thank you.